Welcome to Canada's Social Changemakers. My name is Justin Douglas, and today I am here with Ngozi Paul. Ngozi is a actor, writer, director, and producer, including the production company Emancipation Arts, which she founded. She might not recognize her from the television show, The Kink in My Hair, or from the production, uh, The Emancipation of Ms. Lovely. And she also is the founder and creator of Free Up, an organization dedicated to Emancipation Day in Canada and raising activism and awareness. And we're gonna get into all of that. So thank you, Ngozi, for joining me today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Justin. It is a pleasure to have you here. I'm a huge fan of all the multitude of work that you have done so far in Canada. Uh, but just to introduce yourself to some of the people who may have not be familiar with you or getting re-familiar with you, how did you start your process in the creative arts in Canada? <laughs> well, I would say that I started my process in the creative arts in Canada in drama enrichment when I was in grade six. Um, all the way back then. All the way back then. All the way back then. I could go further back to, uh, um, uh, actually, but this was in the United States. I was on a, on a trip um, to Boston with my mom and uh, I went missing in what? the mall um, for several hours. And I was found um, in one of those three-way mirrors where they had wheels on them. So I closed them around me and was just talking to myself. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, uh, at that moment, you realized... Mother. Huh? Is that at that moment, you realized you were meant to be an actress? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing because um, uh, even like, you know, sort of growing up and, and even with drama and Richmond and everything, I... Uh, um, storytelling, talking to myself in the mirror, talk, like making up scenarios at home as the youngest kid, like just like using, like, you know, finding refuge in my imagination has been something that I've, I've done always, ever since I can remember. Um, and so um, the decision to, to become an actor um, happened, um, when I rebelled, I was supposed to go to a Seventh-day Adventist school um, for university and I rebelled and moved out and got my own apartment and a boyfriend. And, um, and uh, it was then where I was like, yeah, I actually want to be an actor. And um, I guess I was like 19, 19, 20 years old. And, um, and my, my professional acting career started at the Stratford Festival. So you've had a multitude of experiences at the festivals. Uh, sort of how did you get involved and what are some of the, your, your proudest performances, let's say? Um, well, the, the Stratford Festival is actually, whenever anyone asks me about theater school, I always kind of uh, think of the festival as my school because um, that was the first gig that I ever had. Um, <laughs> it was the first monologue audition I ever had. Um, was for the festival and in and, and uh, <laughs> oh that's so when I just think about it it's so funny um, um, yeah and that was my yeah my first job my first uh, that was the year we went to um, uh, New York we went to New York City that year um, and uh, that was you know where I you know learned about theater in in um in canada in earnest um uh yeah you know i took all the classes i, I remember being astonished that you got paid for this you know <laughs> um and i and i stayed there when i when i started there I, I actually spent two seasons at the festival and in um during my second um year at the festival i actually moved out of Stratford and commuted. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then somehow through all of this, you had the time to write and produce this thing called the kink in my hair. Can you talk about that one a little bit? Well, yeah, well, the, the, the kink in my hair. So I was in the play, um, which was a fringe festival 
at the Fringe Festival. And it was actually when I left Stratford that I, I got into producing. And I got into producing actually, and it's so interesting now, 2020, um, and the conversation has changed so much. Um, but I got into producing because I wanted to know who was in charge of deciding what gets made. Uh, because it was cra it's crazy, was, was crazy. Like if you think it's bad now, like, you know, um, 20 years ago when I started, um, it, it was just like, you heard the craziest things um, about the reasons why you would not be given opportunities. Um, and in Stratford, um, uh, I was told that I could have gotten one particular part, but then they wouldn't know how to cast me in the rest of the season. So I didn't get cast as the lead. And in Stratford, I was called um, a puck from the hood. Oh my God, you're kidding me. No, no, I'm not kidding. It's, these are all true stories. Um, yeah. And I have so many, but... Um, so that's why I became a producer and, and just circling back to the kink in my hair, I was an actor in the play and uh, I can't remember what the opportunity was, but there was, um, I think it was Vision Television was looking for new TV ideas. And at the time I was, um, so acting and, and an assistant for uh, Tanya Lee Williams. And uh, so we put together a, like a pitch package and I had, um, the first show that I ever created was a show called Lord Have Mercy. And so I was like, okay. this would be a great TV show in rehearsal mm -hmm. for the kink and brought it to Trey and brought it to Wayne at the time um, for us to make it into a television series. And because I had been working in the world of producing and everything from I was a casting, extras casting assistant, to like a PA, like, you know, you know, you're 20 years old, all you have is energy, energy, energy. So you're just running around doing <laughs> everything. <laughs> um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, and we, did, and we did, that's how we developed the, the kink in my hair, um, was really literally from me being in rehearsal and, and bringing it to Trey and Wayne, uh, who was directing it at the time and being like, hey, let's make this into a, TV show and I had just um, produced the television show a couple of years earlier so I kind of knew how to do it and we worked on the kink um, television series at the same time while the play was developing um, and uh, produced you know helped the, in the producing of the early versions of the play as well um, and uh, it was like at least four or five years like four years, you know, when I think of from when we started developing the TV show and got some development money and putting together the Bible and then you pitch it here and pitching it to a bunch of different places. It was, um, yeah, it was at least four or five years before it got picked up and made into a television series. And it ran for two seasons on global as well as other yeah. Canadian platforms. And it's now available yeah. on CBC Gem. So mm -hmm. for anyone who would like to catch it. I would highly recommend it. Um, will you give just a quick synopsis? Uh, I, I know what I think about it. I've watched a few episodes. I love it. I enjoy it. It's funny. It's humorous. Uh, but how would you uh, describe the television show? I would describe the kink in my hair um, as uh, like, a, a, um, like a family show uh, that is rooted in the Caribbean community. Um, and an opportunity, and one of the first opportunities to experience the stories of um, Black women and the Black community through the stories of Black women um, where they're multi-dimensional human beings. Um, and uh, yeah, revolutionary, and it's an evergreen show. It's just sort of like, yeah, you know, the tag was if you wanna know about a, a woman, a Black woman especially, touch her hair um because that's where all the secrets and uh joys and laughters are are held and um yeah and i and i and i it is so interesting now like perspective um we shot that show 12 years ago mm -hmm. which is crazy you know um uh and it was really the first of its kind in canada in terms of having female women of color 
uh, in lead roles yes. in terms of visibility in Canadian television. And so yeah. that by itself is something to be so proud of, but also the content. there hasn't been another one since. And there hasn't been another one since. And the content of the show was so good on top of the fact that it was creating opportunities for people who wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. have opportunities in, and even, I mean, across the board, this is one in, in the series that I've had and have commented with other actors and actresses and producers that it's hard to have a Canadian television and entertainment industry that remains in Canada, being a neighbor to this massive thing, this machine that is the United States just south to us. But even within that context, finding places for visible minorities has been a challenge. And for you to be able to bust through that door and create something that no one else has been able to do is is why I, one of the reasons why I think you are such a social change maker and encapsulates why I think people need to, to know more about you and why this interview has been so important to me. Uh, but there's another one that you are involved in and that's called The Emancipation of Mrs. Uh, Ms. Lovely. I'm very mad about... that it's Ms. <laughs> Can you talk it's about actually, that? That's a, like side note, that actually is a thing where I'm just like, I remember the first time a doctor or something called me Mrs. Mm. And I was like, um, it's Ms. It will remain Ms. It always is Ms. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, what is he now? Like he he just he just remains Mr. That's yeah, there's definitely a gendered a gendered thing there. It was just like Anyways, but no, I, had, I think I took my, my doctor a little bit off. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Mrs. Fair. Totally fair. Um, um, okay. Ms. Lovely. The Emancipation of Ms. Lovely. Yeah, so, so um, that is a play uh, that I wrote um, and we performed it in 2017 at Crow's Theater. And it is the story, uh, coming of age story of a young um, Caribbean Canadian woman um, intertwined with the story of Sarah Bartman, um, who uh, was referred to as the Venus Hottentot, uh, who lived towards the end of the 19th century and she was put um, uh, in human zoos, uh, a black woman because of the shape of her body. And so it's that story intertwined with the story a modern day coming of age story um, of Lovely. And, uh, and um, yeah, just have been, we're actually gonna be doing it again. I'm like wondering, can I say that? <laughs> but now I don't know, like it's gonna be interesting to see what theater will be, but um, that's a play that did really well. We got nominated for six Doras, we won two Dora awards including outstanding new play and um, outstanding musical direction and composition will lead and uh, eloquence the amazing they play the ancestors um, and so we're in dialogue with the musicians throughout the piece so um, yeah it uh, it's um, a play that's super dear to my heart and uh, uh, there's another one where you kind of like work on it and actually developing it into a television series right now as we speak. Good. So, Fingers uh, crossed. Congratulations on the Dora Awards. They're much deserved and I would love to see it as a as a television series as well. Uh, maybe produced in Vancouver so I could be closer to you. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, you never know. But uh, you also do this thing, this production company that you have created called Emancipation Productions. Uh, what is the production company? What's the kind of work you do? How did the idea come about? So, um, so Emancipation Arts is a production company. Um, I used to, my production company used to be called Ngozika Productions, which was, um, uh, Ngozika is the full um, sort of like Igbo version of, of my name, Ngozi. And, um, and then I changed it actually to Emancipation Arts um, to just because of the expansiveness of emancipation. Um, and, and it was after I wrote The Emancipation of Ms. Lovely. And um, my, the purpose of, of emancipation arts is to um, take productions, to take stories, 
um, unique, authentic stories um, from often um, unheard communities, often marginalized communities, and bring them to the world. Um, so we say from like grassroots productions to the world stage. Um, and really it's, uh, you know, that whole, like, you know, we're, we're yogis or we're trying to be, be the change you want to see. So um, for me, uh, like I didn't, I just became a producer because I needed to produce <laughs> the stuff that I wanted to do and, and, and things with my friends and, and um, uh, I just wanted to, and, and still want to just create space and make it easier so you don't have to always start again from the beginning, you know? Um, and obviously as a black woman, I tell stories from an Afrocentric perspective. Um, or maybe that's not obvious, but, but it is uh, obvious to me. Um, and so I, uh, <laughs> I am, yeah, I, 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 our hope at Emancipation Arts is that the work that we do will always be work that is creating space um, for other artists, for um, emerging voices, for unsung stories and ideas. Um, uh, that sort of catalyzes unity and collectivity and uh, freedom of thinking. And they create an opportunities for people who uh, wouldn't necessarily have these opportunities otherwise. And it's so admirable that you're like, hey, there's not really a lot of voices in this space. How do I get my voice in there and create opportunities for other voices to be brought up as well? I think is absolutely amazing. It's and so much more fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you can really produce and create, and you're creating opportunities for yourself and for others in a way that not a lot of other uh, production companies have been able to do in this country again. So, I mean, it's just another example of how you have broken out of the mold and done something really special. And on top of all of that, you have also created this thing called Free Up. What is Free Up? What does it do? What's its purpose? Well, I love talking about Free Up. Um... So it was actually 2017 um, when I did The Emancipation of Ms. Lovely that I heard of something called Emancipation Day, which is the day that marks the abolition of slavery across the British Empire. That happened in 1834 is when it took effect. 1833 is when they um, uh, passed the law um, for it to take, take effect in 1834. And I had never heard of it. I'd never heard of this day, which I still like, I, I can't tell that story enough. It's just like, I have a company named Emancipation Arts. I wrote The Emancipation of Miss Lovely. I have Afrocentric parents. You know, I, I had, I've been doing, <laughs> you know, um, the work, interested in this work. And somehow it, this missed my radar. Um, and, and vowed from that point that moving forward that I would always um, produce something for Emancipation Day. And, and like what, like I say to uh, Khadija Salawu is our artistic director of Free Up, um, which is a youth led festival where young artists and emerging artists have an opportunity to celebrate Emancipation Day and to answer the question, what does freedom mean to me? Um, and I just think that with Emancipation Day, we have an opportunity, and this was also back in Canada 150, you know, and there's all sort of like, um, I guess you can call it controversy or um, uh, we're looking for ways for us to discuss our history, for us to experience it, for us to have a, a better understanding of where we are and what it is that we celebrate. When we're celebrating Canada 150, what does that mean? Does that mean that means something very different to the indigenous population in Canada? Um, what is what is the legacy of colonialism? All of these kinds of things. And I'm like, wow, Emancipation Day is an opportunity for us to celebrate freedom now, but also have a better understanding of what the shoulders upon which we stand. Um, and so free up. Um, is is a show that we've been doing ever since 2017 uh where where young artists take the stage and it's really was just like create a platform i'll host it 
Um, Khadija, our artistic director, uh, will help program it, working with a youth organization called Youth for Change. And really, it's just about creating a platform and asking the question to the citizens of Canada, hey, what does freedom mean to you? You know, and if we have this liberty to speak, what will you do with it? What is civic engagement? Um, and so, so yeah, so that's what, uh, that's what Free Up is. And uh, we just did it this year during the pandemic. Uh, we aired on CBC Gem, August 1st. And I think you can still watch it there. Um, but yeah, Free Up, that's what it is. It is, that's what it is. It's amazing. And it's also one of the things that Free Up is championing now is a petition that is circulating around Canada uh, asking for Emancipation Day to be recognized as a national uh, day of remembrance, national holiday. Can you speak to that a little bit, please? Well, Emancipation Day is only recognized officially in Ontario right now. I didn't know that. In Vancouver, actually, that this last August, Vancouver now recognizes Emancipation Day. It's one of those things where it's just like, say what now? <laughs> How can Emancipation Day not be recognized nationally? Yeah. It's, it, 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 it's, it's like, it's a head scratcher. Um, but when we wanna talk about uh, colonialism and um, marginalization, then you could just really point to something like this. Um, it's an imp incredibly important part of, uh, um, of our legacy as a country. Um, and the fact that it's only recognized in Ontario right now seems like there's a major disconnect. And, um, and so the petition um, that has been put forward is, is really for Canadians, it's an opportunity for Canadians to say, yes, we want Emancipation Day to be recognized nationally. Um, there is a, a private bill that has been put forth as well. And again, we have the opportunity just to send a message and letters to our MPs and say, hey, we wanna recognize Emancipation Day nationally. It's not even for it to be a holiday yet. I'm like one step at a time. This is just like, <laughs> just recognize it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for yeah. anyone watching the interview, we will have a link uh, in the description below where you can sign the petition and get involved. The petition will be open until August 22nd. Is that right? August 22nd. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So please and, take the and, time. And after August 22nd, um, uh, we'll have letters available that you can send to your MPs and um, asking them to support the, the private bill that has been brought forward. And, and there have been bills that have been brought forward before that have died on the floor. Uh, 2018 was the last time. And again, you, you have to ask yourself like, what's, what's really going on here? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, well, it's such a simple thing and I feel like the timing is right and, that, and I really do believe that this year will be the year that, um, that, uh, that Emancipation Day will be recognized nationally. And so 2021, it's gonna be a national party. This year we were in Montreal of, yeah. and in, in Stratford and uh, Toronto um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of politics and political engagement, you come from a very politically engaged family. Uh, your sister, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing as well, is running for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada, Annemie Paul. Uh, do you want to just speak to that quickly and your, the activism, where the activism in the family comes from? Well, yes. Um... I have a few things to say about that. It's so, it's, it's, I can honestly say, um, even though I've been engaged creatively um, in terms of activism and, and uh, really for me, it's just like, it's been a matter of just allowing, like creating a world where I can be myself, you know, um, and where my own freedoms are not, um, are not caged because of, you know, some of the structures that exist. Um, uh, but Anime has been sort of like, she was a page, you know, she's, my sister has always been politically engaged and she has the one who has taught me, if it wasn't for Anime, 
there's so many things I always like to joke to her and I'm like, people don't know, like I'm a pamphlet reader. And my, <laughs> my, my civic engagement was like elections coming up. You know, I, I voted liberal cause my parents voted liberal, you know, growing up. It's like, what are the bullet points? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. I like that name. I, I, I know that guy, Trudeau. Good, good. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, um, you become an artist and you're like, okay, NDP, like, you know, and I actually had always wanted to engage more with the Green Party, especially um, when they were leading the charge around legalization um, uh, of, of marijuana and actually legalization of other drugs, because that's something that I've always, and same thing with um, uh, uh, sex workers as well, um, decriminalizing that. Um, and that their policies always appealed to me, but it felt like it, it, it felt like it was just so like, so far it was inaccessible and i'm like oh i can't really vote for them nobody really votes for this what's this green thing mm -hmm. um and so my sister really bridged that gap you know and and for my sister to choose to run with the green party um and just being like hey it's actually this is the time where we actually need to make real innovative and uh and radical change um, for us to have a sustainable future. Um, and so, yeah, so I would say that anime, like the same way that I was like in my mirror <laughs> as a kid, mm -hmm. um, anime was on the debate team and in, on student council, like, you know, we were just, we're doing our thing. Um, and our parents, my dad was a Pan-Africanist, um, uh, one of the founders of the Black Action Defense Committee. Um, my mother has her famous line. I remember I was at Women's Health and Women's Hands and we were um, marching for uh, International Women's Day uh, many years ago. And my mom, she's like, uh, you know, I've been marching for years and if there's one thing that I would have to say to all of you young people who are gonna start marching now and, and carrying the baton, wear comfortable shoes. <laughs> She's right. I've been on those marches. You need some comfortable shoes. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Been there, there, done that. Yeah. She's talking about how they used everybody. to wear heels. Mm -hmm. Little pumps. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, yeah, learn, so that's where again. that kind of comes from and and uh and enemies running and uh I think um the 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 cutoff for new like for new green party members in order to vote in the election in the fall is uh, september 3rd yeah. um and yeah i i'm i'm so proud of her and so grateful for her and her commitment and uh to me i'm just like okay we we, we need you to be prime minister of canada <laughs> yeah i she well not only is she the most capable, in my opinion, one of the most capable politicians I've seen with a new energy and a new idea, she would also be the first woman of color to represent a major political party in Canada. I think it's the second yes. time that a woman, of black woman has run for, for a party. Um, but that sort of bridges it to my next question, which is as a woman of color in Canada, can you talk to your experience maybe a little bit? Uh, because if she's encountered your sister has encountered a little bit of racism on on the campaign trail mm -hmm. and i would imagine that you also as a woman of color in canada who's out in the public on a television show and theater uh has had to encounter some less than ideal situations and so maybe could you talk a little bit about your experience and how that relates into the black lives matters movement and how we in canada are sort of faring well, um, you know, in terms of encountering racism, um, I, you, I've, I've encountered racism from childhood. Uh, um, and also, um, thankfully being raised to occupy any space you know, like we were, we were raised with a tremendous amount of dignity. Um, and, and that we, that we are just as uh, deserving, just as capable. 
and and we were also taught that racism is actually a deficiency but not ours um and uh and also you know taught with the you know one of tony morrison's um quotes where it's just like we actually we were taught that we had a moral high ground um uh because when when somebody this is this is this is what I was raised with. Um, but when somebody comes to you, um, you know, and with racial slurs or, or is, or has, as racist ideologies, um, that says about, that speaks to their character. Um, and of course, you know, um, I actually, uh, sort of did the mental gymnastics or whatever as a kid is that because I have experienced those kinds of things like from like childhood, you know, um, that you know that th that's not me and whatever it is that you, that you are throwing at me is actually just strengthening me, you know, um, it actually, it actually makes me stronger um, and more resilient because I have to weather, I've had to weather that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, having spent a lot of time in the United States as well, um, and also internationally in different parts of Europe, my sister lived in Europe for a while as well. I mean, I mean, this is talking like, it's so funny because I mean, I've been followed around in stores, like cliches. I've been called the N-word. Um, I've been I've been working when I was working in Stratford, um, where people who came and saw the show that I was in would saw me and a friend of mine, another bl black actor, walking down the street, and then recoiled and stood in the doorway because <laughs> they saw us coming. You know, yeah. um, like you have these experiences and. Um, but I really feel strongly that uh, I made the decision that I am not a victim. Um, and and I'm, I will never be anybody's victim um, and certainly not for their deficiency. And so I don't know in terms of speaking to it in terms of like nationally, yes, there, there are, we do have to dismantle um, uh, colonialist ideas um, and and my path to that has been through the work through um, through art through creation um, you know you can always imagine it another way you know it can it can all I'm like if you you're not casting me so I had to imagine myself <laughs> in the part you know mm -hmm. um, Back when it was like, you, there's no way that you're going to have a woman. Like in Free Up this year, we had Amaka Ume, um, who was cast to play Hamlet at the Stratford Festival. When I was mm -hmm. at the Stratford Festival, they were not giving those parts to Black women. No, of course not. They were not doing it, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, but, but, now, but now they are. But even the Stratford Festival was not, was not created with stories for me in mind. Nor do I think that uh, um, Shakespeare was thinking about little Black and Gozi, Paul, <laughs> when he was mm -hmm. writing his plays. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's all to say is I feel like we are um, a relatively young nation. Um, many of us are first generation Canadians. Um, especially many people of color, first generation Canadians, even though we've had black population here since the 1700s. Um, we're, we're from people from a diverse, diverse cultures from all over the world and that's part of our strength. Um, we also have some of the most um, difficult and painful histories around our treatment of indigenous people. Um, and, 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 and what we can do, I, I personally feel that we, we need to reconcile that through dialogue, through conversation, through policies, um, and through loving kindness and compassion. Um, and what I like about Canada the most is I feel 
that part of our national identity, um, right or left wing, is that we're nice. Canadians are nice. <laughs> we want to be nice. Even when we're terrible, we want to be yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, and so um, we want to be nice. And in general, we, we, we don't want to be violent in general. I'm just talking about like overarching culture. Like we're not guns. We're my guns. Um, that's not, that's not who we are as a nation. Um, and so for me, I feel like that gives us an opportunity um, to, to really be a world leader in terms of the conversation, in terms of healing, in terms of, um, in terms of reconciliation, um, and, and, and changing the way that we tell the story of our history you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah i agree with all of that and i think i mean it's not you or anyone else's job to educate anybody else in terms of racism or acceptance or any of these things but it's an important conversation to have because we as canadians like to think that somehow um, we are less racist or less um or nicer than our american counterparts and that somehow it doesn't apply to us but it does and it needs to be continually talked about until it's no longer an issue. And mm -hmm. the only way to make that happen is to have these conversations, even though sometimes they're difficult and it means having to look at things in a new way. And so with whatever small platform I have, I want to bring as much awareness and conversation to the table as much as possible. And that includes every type of voice in Canada. And so people with different abilities, the LGBT community, uh, black Indigenous people of color, migrant workers, sex workers, anyone who feels that they are not part of the mainstream conversation needs to have access to a voice. And that's yes. what I would really hope to, to be able to provide and, and help facilitate these conversations. So even though you've had all of these amazing accomplishments as a person, to then discuss some very personal issues on top of that. And so thank you for sharing, sharing those experiences. Um, yeah. How has COVID-19 affected the production company, your work that you're doing? And, uh... Oh, I think that, um, I think I'm still in shock. I think I'm still yeah. in shock. You know, I, um, as you know, uh, went to Nicaragua in February, January, February um, of this mm -hmm. year. And, um, uh, did some healing work and took a, my uh, moto yoga teacher training um, and then came back to pandemic. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and then also during this pandemic, I also, I lost my father um, who was at a long-term care facility and um, it was very painful because I didn't get to see him for months before he passed away and, and, uh, and feel that he was neglected. You know, there's sort of a lot of stories of elderly people who were neglected and, and knowing that I, I didn't get to speak to him as well um, has been really, really painful. Um, My deepest condolences. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's been really tough and I, but, but what I, I know, and it's not to minimize like my own personal experiences is that so many people are having these, it's like, it's like the difficulties of life are highlighted <laughs> and, you know, and the difficulties of life persist. And then also there's a pandemic. So there's like a collective trauma um, and then, and then of course, um, uh, the capturing of the, uh, murder of, uh, George Floyd and, um, uh, Breonna Taylor, um, uh, being, being shot as well, um, south of the border and, um, this sort of, uh, global eruption around, um, racial equality and social justice, um, all of those things are all happening all at once. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's a, it's a solid amount. It's a solid amount. A and, then, and then as well, uh, you know, someone who like really works in theater and really, really thrives in live space um, and, and thrives in like um, 
coming together in terms of that's what really gives me energy. Um, so being very uncertain around what theater is going to look like and uh, productions that I had slated for this year um, canceled. Um, canceled probably never to come back. Um, we don't know how they will come back, what, what any of it is going to look like you know so it's it's i mean i'm not the i know that i'm not the only one but it's been a very difficult time um and uh and it, it's actually funny because at the beginning of the pandemic part of the experience was like there was a slowing down and we became at least i became very still and you know was really sort of zeroing into um my meditation practice, spending time with family, you've got kids to, to um, work with differently. And then all of this social global unrest mm -hmm. that has just like the deluge, you know, and what's happening south of the border, it's actually quite scary. Of course. Um, so so uh, I really feel as though what I'm trying to do is to um, stay healthy, um, you know, keep a, a mindfulness practice that's consistent, um, an asana practice, uh, you know, that is consistent, um, and just really care, really take, try to take care of myself and take care of my loved ones and my community and like, really doing work is a bit tougher right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like harder, even producing free up. It's just that much tougher. Um, but really like um, trying to allow everything to be still and move forward in a way that has a certain level of alignment um, and not try to make things operate the way that they did before the pandemic. Okay. I think that's the key. Yeah. I mean, we keep sort of being told about this new normal, but the new normal is whatever we as a society want the new normal to be. And this yes. is the time as that's difficult as it is. <laughs> Vote for enemy, exactly. Yeah, it's just like, it's so weird because you know there was going to be, you're going to travel across the country and meet people and, and that's energizing, at least for me, you know, where you get to like mm -hmm. talk to people and hug people and, you know, I told you I was going to come out to the West Coast and I was going to come and see you and, you know, like that, all of that is gone. And so just trying to figure out how to yeah. reclaim that and how to nurture yourself through through that transition yeah it's an interesting time and um i just really hope that through all of the turmoil that that positive things can come out of it and so that means having a reckoning on on the black lives matter and in indigenous movements and on changing um the way that we treat each other in society and raising ourselves all up and looking at capitalism and being like, hey, maybe it doesn't make sense for one person to make $13 billion during a pandemic, Jeff Bezos, while the rest of everyone is going into poverty. And so- but, but This is the thing with that. I will, I like, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's I don't time. even care if he makes $13 billion, but pay your taxes. I'm like, Okay, Amazon, make a bazillion, trillion, bazillion, trillion, gazillion mm -hmm. dollars, but pay your taxes. Yeah. You know, pay and, your employees and a minimum wage. Pay your, pay your taxes, pay your employees a minimum wage, and we. A living wage. People, a living wage, right? And we as people, we must demand that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And actually say, you know what? I understand that it might be more inconvenient, but I'm not going to support you unless you unless you have better business practices that take that that consider the community. And you know, it's like not every you can't be perfect. You know, it's difficult, but like little small changes that actually hold hold people accountable. Yeah, that's exactly you know, it. You know, hold them accountable. Yeah. You know, and I'm I'm just like. 
13 billion dollars that was in one day though right wasn't that one Some, day it was something insane yeah i have to check the numbers again but it was some, something ridiculous billion like, dollars yeah 13 billion dollars billion dollars yeah, and people are like we can't pay for health care i'm like and your and but and your employees um can't take a washroom break exactly or if they try to create a union they get fired yeah so i mean this is the reckoning that i think we're having and that again like it's happening in the united states but it's happening all around the world and we in canada need to be having these conversations and to be more civically engaged than we've ever been before in order to really make the change that needs to happen and this is what i think the pandemic one of the things despite all of the horrible things that have come out of the pandemic this is what it, it's a time to reflect on how to make things better and you are one of those people in our Canadian society who's working extremely hard to make things better for everyone. And so thank you, <laughs> oh, Ngozi Paul, for the work that you do with uh, Emancipation Arts, with Free Up, uh, the kink in my hair available for viewing on CBC Gem. I would highly encourage you to sign the petition, again, available uh, in the links provided below. And find out a little bit more about Ngozi Paul, uh, you can look at some of the other links also that I will be providing. So thank you again for your time, oh. for being such a warm and loving human being, and for sharing your experience and the work that you do with me today. I'm so happy to be speaking to you. Um, I, I love all of this and uh, always looking for opportunities for authentic connection and communication conversation. Yeah.